So again, we are talking about the Christian's attitude towards the Old Testament scriptures. Last week, we talked a little bit about that the Christian is not to view the Old Testament scriptures as our authority for today. We're going to get to how we should view the Old Testament scriptures later on in this lesson. I don't know if we'll get to it today, but we will get to it before we are done this lesson. We had said that there are really two extremes when it comes to the Old Testament. Both of the extremes are wrong. The one extreme is that the Old Testament is our authority and that we have to follow it in all things, or that even they will admit it's just part of the things. But if we're under a law, we can't pick and choose which part of the law we're under. So uh, they, they say, well, we have to follow the law of Moses. Now, on the other side, we have, well, the law of Moses is in our authority today, so we should really just discard the Old Testament and not really study it at all. You can sometimes run into that problem when uh, among brethren who uh, want to study the New Testament all the time and rarely want to study the Old Testament. And, and in our podcast, if you've, been, if you've been following along, when we do get to the Old Testament, we've done Genesis, Exodus, and Leviticus. And I think many of us, myself included, learned a lot from the book of Leviticus. It's a book we often skip uh, because it just has a whole bunch of laws, and we know that our, they're not our laws for today. And so we don't bother to, to, um, uh, to get acquainted with them. But when you start dealing with the sacrifices in the old law, you come to realize, oh, those were talked about in the New Testament, too, uh, as, a, as spiritual sacrifices. And so when we understand what they are in the Old Testament, we can understand what they are in the New Testament. And so both extremes are wrong. So what we started with, though, was the Old Testament is not our law. We had to deal with the one extreme. And we talked a little bit about Ephesians chapter 2, verses 11 to 16, how the old law was removed so that the Jew and the Gentile can be re reconciled in one body in the church under Christ. We had discussed that the Gentiles were not under the law of Moses. And, if, and they were never told to be under the law of Moses. That's what the entire book of Galatians is about. Most of the book of Romans is about. Acts chapter 15 is about. Uh, and the book of Hebrews as well, showing Christians this was a first century problem and it is a 21st century problem, trying to get people to realize that the law of Moses was for the Jews. The Gentiles were never under it, and they are still not under it, uh, under the law of Christ, and even the Jew needs to recognize they need to be uh, under Christ's covenant. So that was Ephesians 2. And then we talked about Colossians chapter 2, verses 14 to 17, how the law was blotted out. It was contrary to us. And the reason it was contrary to us was not because it was a bad law, but because it convicted of sin, but had no remedy for it. And when you have no remedy for sin, you're lost in your sins. There were sacrifices that could be offered, but not one of those sacrifices was good enough to remove sins. All it did was provide one with the promise that God would forgive their sins when that sacrifice, that perfect sacrifice, was made. And of course, Jesus was that perfect sacrifice. But when Christ died on the cross, he took away the old law. He had a remedy for it. He fulfilled it. And we are now under a new covenant. This morning we're going to start with Romans chapter 7. Romans chapter 7. Uh, we're going to read verses 1 through 6. Tim, uh, why don't you get verses 1 through 3, and I'll get verses 4 through 6. Just remember to speak up a little bit so we can... Romans 7, verses 1 to 3 for Tim, and I'll get verses 4 to 6. Do you not know, brothers, 
for I am speaking to men who know the law, that the law has authority over a man only as long as he lives. For example, by law, a married woman belongs to her husband as long as he is alive, but if her husband dies, she is released from the law of marriage. So then, if she marries another man while her husband is still alive, she is called a adulteress. But if her husband dies, she is released from the law and is not an adulteress, even though she married another man. Therefore, therefore, my brethren, you also have become dead to the law through the body of Christ, that you may be married to another, to him who is raised from the dead, that we should bear fruit to God. For when we were in the flesh, the sinful passions which were aroused by the law were at work in our members to bear fruit to death. But now we have been delivered from the law, having died to what we were held by, so that we should serve in newness of the spirit and not in oldness of the letter. This passage, we often, <clears throat> when we deal with Romans 7, we use it to teach about marriage. And it's a good passage to teach about marriage. But I like Tim's, uh, I like Tim's wording in verse 2. His, the beginning of verse 2 said, For example, that means that whatever was in verse 1, verse 2 was a way to understand it. So, do you not know, brethren, for I speak to those who know the law, this is the law of Moses, that the law has dominion over a man as long as he lives. So in other words, when we have a law, we're under that law as long as we're alive. When we die, we are no longer under that law. Why? Because we're dead. The law is for this earth. We're just talking about physical law here. Physical law is for this earth. When I die, I don't have to worry about speeding on the highway, stealing, murdering, any of those things. I'm not here. The law was for this earth. Well, the law of Moses. You were under the, if you were, if you lived and died under the law of Moses, you were under that law. Now, here's a problem. Or, or, here, here, here's the example. So we'll get to the problem in a second. The example Paul used was marriage. Because, because this is sort of an abstract sort of thing, Paul giving us an example helps us understand. A husband and a wife. God's intention for marriage, as we discussed last week in our lesson, was marriage is to be for life. We are not to want to divorce. And so when we get married, we need to realize that we're bound to our spouse as long as they live. That is the general principle. We're not going to get into Matthew 19. That is the general principle. We are bound to our, to our spouse as long as they live. What happens when they die? We are no longer bound to our spouse. Not anymore. We're allowed to marry another when they die. Uh, if we did so while they were alive, what would we be called? An, an adulterer. And so that's the physical example Paul uses to make a spiritual point. Now, I believe we, we sometimes can make uh, a little bit of an error as to what as to what's going on because we want to come along and say well Jesus removed the law he did he fulfilled the law and so we come along and say well the law is what died no the law is not what died here uh, who died Christians died they died to the law when they became a Christian when we die to the law, we're no longer under its dominion any longer. We are not under that law any longer. Uh, we were buried with Christ. Let's go back to Romans chapter 6, which is, which is just one chapter back. And uh, we, uh, I want to get this picture because Paul is making the same point here. In Romans chapter 6, starting at verse 1, What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Certainly not. For he who died to sin, for shall we who died, sorry, how shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? Or do you not know that as many of us were baptized into Jesus Christ, were baptized into his death? 
Therefore we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. Romans, Paul had just finished telling the Romans uh, that they had died to sin, that when they were buried with Christ in baptism, they were buried, and then God raised them to walk in newness of life. And so now when we come to chapter 7, Paul's making the point concerning the law. Well, you've died. You're not under that law anymore. You are under a new law. Why would we want to go back to a law we're not under anymore? Because we've died to it. We're under a new law. People say, well, I, I'd be committing adultery. As long as you were alive, yes. As long as you were under that law, yes, you would be committing adultery, spiritual adultery. However, you died. We don't often think, oh, well, someone dies and we don't know what happens after death. So that's where the abstract sort of, sort of uh, gets in the way a little bit. But Christians die to sin. We're raised to walk in newness of life. We are not under the law that uh, couldn't do that. The law of Moses never commanded baptism. Never commanded obedience to Jesus. Commanded obedience to God, but never baptism. The new covenant demanded baptism, and when we were baptized, we died. And so we are not under that law anymore. Uh, what, how, who are we married to? We're married to Christ. If we try to follow both laws, we're committing spiritual adultery. That's just a plain fact. Uh, in Ephesians 5, we're, we're told that we're married to Christ. How can I be married to Christ and be married to Moses at the same time? That's just a spiritual impossibility. And so... Uh, the Old Covenant has been taken out of the way. That's what we need to realize. Christ has made possible the New Covenant under which we live today. Let's get some verses on this. Let's go to Hebrews chapter 7. We're going to be in the book of Hebrews for a lot more, uh, for the next few minutes, so you can stay there. Hebrews chapter 7. Tim, you want to get verse 12. For when there is a change of the priesthood, there must also be a change of the law. All right. In the book of Leviticus, we are told who the priests were going to be. They were going to be of the house of Aaron. That's who the priests were going to be. The first five priests were Aaron, who was the priest, Nadab and Abihu, and Ithamar and Eleazar. Those were the first five priests. Nadab and Abihu died in chapter 10 for trying to offer strange fire before the Lord. So once, shortly after the priesthood was inaugurated, there were three priests, one high priest and two priests. And it grew, the priesthood grew after that. But only, only Aaron's family could be priests. We often think of it as the Levitical priesthood. It is the Levitical priesthood because Aaron was of the tribe of, uh, of uh, Levi. But those other members, Moses' family, for instance, Moses and Aaron were brothers. Moses' family, his two sons, uh, Gershon and I think it's Eliezer, uh, could not, could not be priests. All of the sons of all the other sons of Kohan could not be priests. All of the other sons of, uh, of uh, 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 Levi could not be priests. Only those of the house of Aaron. Now, this entire chapter here in, uh, in uh, Hebrews chapter 7 talks about Jesus being a priest. Now, what tribe was Jesus from? Was he from the tribe of Levi? No. Was he of the, that means obviously he wasn't of the house of Aaron if he wasn't of the tribe of Levi. We find that we know from our study in Luke that John the Baptist was of the tribe of Levi because his father was a priest. John the Baptist was. 
But Jesus was not. Jesus was of the house of Judah. And yet here, we, uh, the Hebrew writer is coming along and saying, Jesus is not only a priest, he's our high priest. Under the law of Moses, that would have been unlawful. Some people come along and say, well, the law of Moses didn't say not to have priests after, the, uh, after another tribe. But the, question, the, the point is, it was silent on that fact. And silence authorizes nothing silence of scripture authorizes absolutely nothing and so since god said priests were going to be after the how uh, from the house of aaron that excluded all other houses the house of david the house of joshua the house of caleb all of those uh, all of those houses excluded from the priesthood because they were not of the house of Aaron. So if Christ is going to be our high priest, Tim read for us in verse 12, necessity required that there was a change in the law. Now, if there was a change in the law, what does that mean? There's a new law. If there's a change in the law, that means the law that was before is no longer the law of today. When the government comes and changes a law, the old law is no longer the law. We have to follow the new law. Our government legalized marijuana in July of last year, uh, in 2019. The old law said if you had any marijuana, you were subject to arrest. The new law says you're allowed, I don't know how much to have, but uh, that doesn't make it right for the Christian to have, don't get me wrong, but it's not illegal to possess a certain amount. You will not get arrested for it. You now can purchase it legally instead of illegally. A policeman can't come along and say, well, on June 30th, 2019, this was the law, therefore I'm gonna apply that law. No, we'd say, that's, no, no, that's the old law. You can't, you can't enforce the old law. You have to enforce the new law. Jesus is a high priest, therefore there is a necessity, a change of the law. Let's stay in Hebrews chapter 7. Let's get verses 18 through 22. Hebrews 7, starting at verse 18. For, for on one hand, there is an annulling of the former commandment because of its weakness and unprofitableness. For the law made nothing perfect. On the other hand, there is a bringing in of a better hope through which we draw near to God. And inasmuch as he was not made priest without an oath, for they have become priests without an oath, but he with an oath, by him who said to him, The Lord has sworn and will not relent, you are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. By so much more has Jesus become a surety of a better covenant. Uh, of a better covenant. Uh, and I, I got a note here to go to Hebrews chapter 8, verse 6. Which, uh, but he has obtained a more excellent ministry in as much as he is also a mediator of a better covenant, which is established on better promises. The law of Moses had a purpose. The law of Moses was to show the Jew that their sinfulness and need on God, but it was also to point them to Christ. That's what the purpose of the law of Moses was. It was not to be able to take away their sins. It, would, it never had that intention. In fact, this passage said, in that the law was weaker because it couldn't remove sins. Jesus came in. He brought in a better hope. If something is better, we should want it. Think about that for a minute. If I tell you, you have... A choice between two meals one of them is well, it's okay and the other one is better what are you going to choose you're going to choose the inferior meal maybe it was made by someone uh, who didn't know what they were doing or perhaps it's a day old and uh, and we have this better meal over here that was made by a, 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 a experienced chef and it's it's um, uh, is fresh and assuming we like both things I'm going to assume we like both things 
You say, which one do you want? Do you want the inferior one or do you want the better one? Almost everyone's going to choose the better one. Oh, yeah, I want the better one. What, 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 you, want the, you want the old car or you want the better car? Oh, well, I want the better one. Well, we're, Christ brought in a better covenant. It was established on better promises, eternal life, forgiveness of sins. That's the that, uh, 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 being brought near to God, having the enmity uh, of sin separating you from God, being taken away, having the ability to pray directly to God. Uh, because, because you're a Christian, you have access to God. Better promises. You can't mix the old with the new. The old couldn't do those things. The new can has better promises. Let's go to Hebrews chapter 10 now. Hebrews chapter 10, Tim's going to start, uh, Tim's going to get 1 to 5, I'll get verses 6 to 10. The law is only a shadow of the good things that are coming, not the realities themselves. For this reason, it can never, by the same sacrifice, repeated endlessly, year after year, may perfect those who draw near to worship. If it could, would they not have stopped being offered? For the worship would have been once for all, and will no longer have fair guilty for their sins. But those sacrifices are an annual reminder of sins because it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. Therefore, when Christ came into the world, he said, Sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but a body you prepared for me. In burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin, you had no ple pleasure. Then I said, Behold, I have come. In the volume of the book, it is written of me to do your will, O God. Previously saying, Sacrifice and offering, burnt offerings and offerings for sin, you did not desire nor had pleasure in them, which are offered according to the law. Then he said, Behold, I have come to do your will, O God. He takes away the first, that he may establish the second. By that will we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. I'm not, uh, I want to save some of this for next week's lesson. It gives you a hint as to, what, uh, as to what we'll be talking about. You'll get the title later on this morning. But what I do want to know is, or what I do want you to understand is, the law is the shadow. The law of Moses is the shadow. When we go outside uh, and on a sunny day, and the sun is high enough in the sky, we're going to see a shadow. In fact, you can see my shadow behind me right now uh, because the lights are shining right on me. Now, no one would ever think that that shadow is me. You know that the shadow is a projection of the real image. Now, the shadow is of me, but what makes my shadow a shadow? Well, you can't see my eyes or my facial expressions. You don't know what I'm wearing. You might have an idea of what I'm wearing, uh, at least, at least that I'm where could be wearing clothing. If I had big bulky clothing on, you might be able to see that. Uh, my shadow over over my shoulder, I can only see my head, maybe a little bit of my shoulders. But, but uh, if I raised my hand, uh, you can't really see that either. But it depends, just depended on the light and where it's coming from. But we know that the shadow is a reflection. Or, uh, well, uh, a representation of the image. All right. And so if we're looking at the shadow, we can have an idea, slight idea, might be able to know the, if a person's skinny or not so skinny, uh, if a person's tall or short, uh, if you have the sun in the right spot, because otherwise your shadow could be a little distorted. Uh, we, we might be able to tell if a person has spiky hair or not spiky hair, and uh, uh, we can figure out some things, but we can't see the image. The old law is the shadow. The old law is not the image. Christ is the image. He's the, he's the one who offered the sacrifice once for all. Here, it, it said that you offered sacrifices yearly. 
Wait, you are, you could offer sacrifices daily in the temple, but that once a year sacrifice for sin that the priest offered, where he went behind the veil in the temple and offered the blood of the bull for his fa for himself and his family and the goats for the children of Israel, the blood of those animals. He offered those sacrifices, and then they offered the animal itself on the altar of burnt offering. It couldn't make them complete or perfect. If it could, they would not, or they would have ceased to offer that offering. If that sacrifice could have done everything that it needed to, they wouldn't have needed to offer it every year. They could have offered it once, and they and the sacrifice would have done enough for everyone in the past and everyone in the future to look to for forgiveness of sins. But the sacrifice couldn't forgive sins. It needed to every year provide a new promise of the forgiveness of sins by God. But it was only a promise. Those who weren't uh, keeping the law of Moses weren't under that promise. It was not a what I call a get out of jail free card or a magical a magical sacrifice that meant I could go out and sin on 364 days of the year and the priests offered on the 365th day and and uh, everything's okay now. No, we got to obey the law of Moses if I was under that law in order to in order to have the benefit of that sacrifice. Well, under the law of Christ it's the same thing. Christ died once. He died once for all, but that does not mean that everyone is just going to automatically have their sins forgiven. You have to obey Christ in faith, submit to God's will, and yes, your past sins and your future sins can be forgiven by that blood. It is not automatic, but it is guaranteed if we in faith follow him. We should not as Christians have to worry about whether or not we for, we're forgiven if we're following what God said. And that includes when we sin, repenting of them, and asking God for forgiveness. If we're in faith walking after God, we can understand that Christ's sacrifice was once for all. And that's important. Christ's sacrifice can make us perfect. Why do we want to go under the law, under a law that could not make us complete. Where we had to offer sacrifices every year and it still was not enough. It was never enough. Christ's sacrifice was more than enough. And so that is what we need to know about the law of Moses. It was imperfect in that sense. Let's go back to Hebrews chapter 9. Tim will get verses 15 to 17 of Hebrews chapter 9. For this reason, Christ is the mediator of new covenant, that those who are called may receive the promised eternal inheritance. Not that he has died as a ransom to set them free from the sins committed under the first covenant. In the case of a will, it is necessary to prove the death of the one who made it because a will is enforced only when somebody has died. It never takes effort by the one who made it is living. All right. So, Christ here is the mediator of a new covenant. I don't know how much more clear it can be. If there is a new covenant, that necessitates that there was an old covenant. If you write a will, sometimes you can you write a will, and then a cup and in a few years later, you write another will. Well, uh, the the new will is only the only thing that's enforced, but it's only enforced after you die. The old law was inaugurated with blood. In Exodus twenty four. Moses took blood and inaugurated the old covenant that God made with Israel. There was a death of an animal. But Christ came along, made a new covenant, not with just Israel, but with all mankind. But it could not be enforced if he didn't die. 
as long as he was living, his new covenant couldn't be enforced. As, if I have a will, and I do have a will, if I have a will, people know that my will is not enforced as long as I live. It's only enforced when I die. People don't get to take anything I have unless I give it to them. That would be stealing. But if it's written in my will and I have died, then it's an inheritance that would be given to those who are written in the will. Well, when it comes to Christ, Christ wrote in the will who is going to be in it. The people who followed him through faith and obedience to God, they're written in the will. That's who's in the will. Christ died putting that will into effect. He is now calling out. You know, when Sometimes when you, uh, when you um, uh, the person, the executor of the will, has to put an ad in the newspaper saying, uh, calling those, or explaining that there was a death, and if you believe you are an inheritor of this will, that you have a claim to it, you need to step forward. There's a period of time that you can step forward and say, I'm an inherit I, I did I am entitled to an inheritance in that will because of X, Y, or Z. I'm this relative, X, Y, or Z. Well, Christ died. Written in the will is that Christians, the ones who in faith obey Christ by repenting of their sins, being baptized into Christ, and following Christ faithfully into death. Those people are in the will. God's calling out. If you're calling, calling out to people, those who are in the will, step forward. And we can step forward and, and humbly submit to God and we'll be in the will. That means we'll receive an inheritance when the inheritance is finally uh, uh, doled out. Well, that's what we see here. The old law didn't have those promises. It did not. But where, uh, so we need to understand that the new covenant was made effective by Christ's death. In the book of Galatians, in Galatians chapter 5, we find out what is wrong with trying to follow the old law and sort of mix the two. In Galatians chapter 4, verses 1 to 4, then we read, Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty by which Christ has made us free, and do not be entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Indeed, I, Paul, say to you that if you become circumcised, Christ will profit you nothing. And I testify again to every man who becomes circumcised that he is a debtor to keep the whole law. You have become estranged from Christ, you who attempt to be justified by the law. You have fallen from grace. For we, through the Spirit, eagerly wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. I heard a Calvinistic preacher trying to explain away this passage because he believes that once you're saved, you can, you can never be lost. You can't fall. And he comes along and says, well, this passage is clearly written to non-Christians. My question to him would have been if he wouldn't have been on the radio. So you're saying non-Christians have grace. That they would be saved. That's nonsensical. Non-Christians don't have grace. You can't fall from something you never had, had, had to begin with. If, I, if, if You don't tell someone, don't fall off that mountain if they're at the bottom of the mountain. Of course they're not going to fall off that mountain because they haven't climbed it. Now, you can, someone on the top, if you climb to the top, say, well, don't fall off the mountain. Well, same here with grace. There were those in, Gal in the churches of Galatia that were being told that you have to follow Christ, but you also have to follow the law of Moses. You have to be circumcised uh, under the law, and you have to follow the law. But Paul said, Christ will profit you nothing if you try to follow the law. Why? Because we don't get to pick and choose what parts of the law we want to follow. 
It's one of my favorite passages to try to tell people there's no such thing as a moral law and a ceremonial law and somehow the Jews could do one and not the other and therefore we can do one and not the other today. You're a debtor to keep the whole law. The animal sacrifices, the, the uh, regulations uh, for leprosy, uh, the regulations for what clothing you wear, how you plant your fields, uh, the priesthood, all of that. You're a debtor to keep the whole law. We can't go back to the law and say, well, we're only going to follow this part, but we'll apply it with Christ. No. Christ said, there's a new law. You follow it. If you want to keep that old law, you don't get any benefit for Christ. You've fallen from grace. You can't receive grace and follow the law of Moses. It's not talking about whether physical, whether it's wrong to physically circumcise someone. But why you do it, that's the reason. When the circumcision often in the book of Galatians is just a representation of following the law of Moses. Because that was commanded to be under the covenant. With a God made with Abraham and later God made with Israel. That you weren't under that covenant if the male wasn't circumcised in the eighth day. Well... If we decide we want to follow the law of Moses, we're, we're, we're better to keep the whole law, and we can't keep the whole law without sinning. And there's no sacrifice for sin. So we need, to, we need to realize that to seek to justify ourselves by the Old Testament is a disaster because we fall from grace. And finally, Tim, if you want to get Matthew chapter 5, verses 17 and 18. Matthew 5, verses 17 and 18. Do not think that I have come to uh, abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. I tell you the truth, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of a pen, will, will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. People love to run to this passage and say, See here, Christ didn't come to abolish the law, but they left out the last part. He came to fulfill it. He came to fulfill it. That means everything was written that was written about him under the old law, that's what he came to accomplish. Now, he said in verse 18, Till heaven and earth pass away, not one jot or one tittle of this law will pass away. People stop there. There is an until all is fulfilled. So, let's think about this for a second. If Christ came to fulfill the law, and he fulfilled the law, what does that mean? The law has passed away. Christ was saying, when it says, till heaven and earth pass away, not one jot or this, one tittle of this law, Jesus is saying, as long as time goes on, until this law is fulfilled, it won't pass away. Not one bit of it will pass away until all is fulfilled. Jesus is saying, you can take that to the bank. That's what he's saying. But Jesus fulfilled the law. He brought in a new covenant. That's the covenant we need to follow. I'm not ashamed to own my Lord, nor to defend.